Hello and welcome to Cambridge Nights. Tonight I'm with a very special guest, Marshall Van Alston. Marshall is a professor in information economics at Boston University Business School and he's also a research scientist at MIT Center for Digital Business. Marshall has been working on the soul of you know, society, the information that connect people, the information that connect businesses. And one quote that I like very much in, in one of your recent papers is this quote by Louis Platt, who, is, um, uh, you know, who was the CEO of HP. And I'm going to paraphrase the quote, but it says, if only HP knew what HP knew, we would, three, we would be three times more productive. You know? So I would like to start asking you a little bit of you know, the, this question of like, the information markets. In, in organizations, there's, there's many people, and it's very hard to know what everyone else knows. So how is the way that organizations now in this world in which they have gotten so big are working around this problem? How are they getting to interact? Well, let's start with one of the basic problems. That once an organization reaches a certain scale, it's very difficult for individuals in the organization to know the other people in the organization and know what those individuals might know. It's really, we're guessing it's around 250 or so people. Below that, you can pretty much know everyone in your organization, but above that, it's very hard to know all the other parties in the organization. So how do you find out if you have an open question? How do you find out if there's an open problem? Um, how do you build a new society or locate the expertise in different organizations? And the problem we've been working on is creating these information exchanges to create kind of social and material incentives to help other people find and locate information inside organizations, um, and also to build their own reputations in order that people can find them. They not just find information that they need, but they can show other people what they have to, off to offer to other organizations and, and other people inside the, um, inside the firm. And so, so tell me a little bit more about like, these information exchanges. You know, what are they? Can, can, can you tell us about a few examples of those? Well, let's start with a couple examples outside the organization that you may be familiar with. If you think of things like Intrade, for example, it's a prediction market for, for figuring out. They aggregate information from lots and lots of different people to predict an outcome in an election. Um, or if you look at uh, Google Flu Predictor, they're aggregating information searches on flu um, symptoms. And they're able to predict flu outbreaks 10 days ahead of the Center for Disease Control because people are suing, um, searching on the flu symptoms before going to the doctor. Um, or another example is um, CERMO, which is a question and answer database that um, uh, doctors can use to ask other physicians in, out, outside their own organization about healthcare problems. And it was set up by a physician who was worried that Merck might be hiding the fact that Vioxx was causing heart attacks. So they're gathering information across broad sources in order to get better answers or to uh, predict outcomes um, ahead of other events. So if you want to pull those same kinds of things inside larger organizations, inside large authorities, inside a university, inside uh, a Cisco, inside a Bank of America, an organization like that, how do you find that expertise? How do you motivate people to share um, and uh, identify others in the crowd who could help you out? What would that expertise be? Okay, and, and how do you do it in, in these organizations? How do they set up incentive structures so people would get to share or people would be able to find other individuals with expertise within their, their, their same kind of like large so, family? Um, there are at least two or three different mechanisms to do it. I guess the, the standard arguments are love, money, and glory. See if you can, one, for kind of the love of it, give people problems that they enjoy working on. Um, two, help them out with reputations. See if you can actually help them build their reputations. And in the third case, give them some kind of reward. One of the best examples of a system like this is actually one put together by um, SAP. It's a developer community system where the developers who are working on technical problems can help each other out. They can pose questions into the marketplace. In exchange for answering a question, you'll get several points back based on the value of your answer. Those can range from two to 10 points. And then your reputation will accumulate based on how many of these questions in Python programming, in um, C++ programming, or customer relationship um, management that you have answered. These reputations have become so valuable that people are actually now trying to link, um, post their reputations online on LinkedIn so that people can find them uh, even in other organizations. Um, it's also the case that they're saving immense sums of money as the peer-to-peer -peer system is having people help each other out rather than SAP trying to provide that support. Um, and they're identifying the lead experts on a given topic. 
within that, people that have answered so many questions have demonstrated they really do know what they're talking about on each of these different categories. So it's a way of percolating up who really knows, and the reputation systems are motivating them to, um, to provide answers to those questions uh, in order that they can demonstrate what they know and help someone else out. Um, to give you another example of why this, is, this seems to be um, working so well, third-party value-added resellers have asked their employees to go in and answer the questions of other companies in order that they can build their own reputations. Now think about that. Where else in the world has it been the case that what previously had been private information is now being voluntarily pushed out there in order to help someone else out in order to build those reputations? It's actually a pretty remarkable phenomenon to be able to create this marketplace in which folks are actually motivated to push information out there um, to help others, but yet also build their own reputations. So now you have markets within firms, and now you're telling a little bit also between firms in which people are exchanging expertise and you know, they're trying to arbitrage the information that they have with the questions that other people have. How do you, uh, how do you balance you know, the willingness of some of these people to kind of like just you know, game that? Sort of like you know, their long-term goals and you could be answering questions on the computer all day to get this reputation and this currency. Is it, is it distortive or, or not? How, how is that balance achieved? That's a great question. We'll start with a little story that we had. Uh, when we were first getting one of these systems going, we actually put in the marketplace uh, that you could win an iPad. Once we put that on the marketplace, it was amazing. Folks were helping each other in order to earn points, and the, you know, the folks that had earned the most points were going to win the iPad. They started gaming the system. Um, you know, they would actually start offering you know, several hundred points for a silly question uh, because the, the prizes were too valuable in that case that we're, put, we're putting on the marketplace. Um, we developed an additional technique, which is also crowdsourcing fraud detection. So suppose, for example, I'm cheating and I'm actually um, offering points out there in exchange for low-value questions, and then that would cause me to leapfrog you in reputation. Well, you might then be motivated to see, well, is he asking a legitimate question or not, or is he gaming the system? We've put things in, t in place to actually detect fraud in much the first, uh, automatically, in much the same way that you might detect credit card fraud. Um, you know, certain pr purchases that you're not normally doing are things that are real outliers in terms of the pricing, so these outliers can be picked up statistically. But we're also using the human population to crowdsource fraud detection, so folks are identifying it when um, uh, fraudulent activity is being conducted inside the marketplace. What, what type of different knowledge markets are there? Are they all the same or are there kind of like different types? Like software industry maybe might be very different from, you know, manufacturing or, or different. They all mm. have the same knowledge needs or, or do markets or these knowledge markets adapt to each one of these? Actually, there are different kinds of markets. You can think of kind of question and answer markets. You can think of prediction markets. You can think of innovation and idea markets. Some of the key distinctions between them are, one, um, is it push versus pull? Um, do you have a specific problem on which you're seeking an answer? So you pose the question to the marketplace, and so you're trying to pull, uh, pull information from the community. The other might be you have this great idea, and you want to submit it to the community to go see if you can get feedback on it or say, geez, we need a different organizational priority, so I want to push this idea out there and see if, if others will also agree with me. That would be kind of a push version of the same thing. All these markets have two sides, so you can often think of them as trying to get information from the market or push information to the market and get feedback and evaluation from it. Um, another cut, another distinction would be to think of whether or not you're trying to get a fact from it and predict an outcome. That's often the prediction market. Stock markets do that. They're predicting, in some sense, the future value of a corporation versus um, something like um, an idea market, my favorite example of that is actually one that was come up by Princeton student government. It was a really neat example where they're trying to figure out how are they going to spend their money. They're not predicting a specific event. They figure out, well, we've got a budget. We're going to have to do something with it. The elected student officials generated several dozen different ideas on how they wanted to spend their money. Then they submitted it to student vote, and the students got to vote on the ideas and add new ones to the marketplace. Well, what happened in the end is by voting up the end, three of the top five final ideas were actually submitted from the students rather than from the original elected officials. So it's a really interesting way of aggregating diverse information and selecting the best ones and pulling them to the top. So that's another way of kind of, of uh, pushing ideas out there and getting evaluations on them uh, for the idea market. 
So historically, there always has been a tension about like, keeping an idea or sharing the idea. Yes. You know? Because uh, ideas are, are very easy. <coughs> you, know, you cannot take them back. You know, that's, that's the point of an idea. Once you know, it made click on you, you know, I cannot remove that click out of your head. You can't force someone to forget. Exactly. You know, so now, has there been a change in that dimension? And, and you know, is this change driven by some external factor? Is it endogenous? Like, There's, You've highlighted a really important problem for organizations and also why it matters so much. Let me give you a, a little data from another study that we did of a Japanese bank. Um, we actually looked at one of these information exchanges inside a, ba a Japanese bank. We had about 2,000 loan officers, so we could look at their, their loan performance and see whether or not information was making them more productive. Um, the first point that we discovered is that there's huge variety in the performance of lo the loan officers. The guys at the top are doing really well, multiple, several times of the guys at the bottom who are, are not doing terribly well. And one of the things that was interesting is that you were using a question and answer exchange, and on average, it was making folks about 10% more productive. It's absolutely huge. 10% productivity gain is roughly equivalent to about a year's worth of education. So it was a big effect. But the interesting thing was the guys at the top were getting almost no benefit, and the guys at the bottom were getting an immense benefit, which goes exactly to the problem that you just highlighted. The guys at the top need to be motivated to share. If they're not sharing, then the guys at the bottom don't have the expertise of the guys at the top. So they can't, they don't know the methods, they don't have the facts, they don't know the, have the wherewithal to perform in the same way the guys at the top do. So you need to provide some motivation for the guys at the shop top to share in order that that information, that non-rival information that others can use, is then pushed out in, into the rest of the organization. So you're absolutely right that um, you need some, some mechanism to reward people for having shared valuable information because they can't take it back once it's out there. The guys at the top didn't need to use the system, and the guys at the bottom really did need to use the system because it made such a huge improvement. And now when we move from the organization to like the networks of organizations, you know, nowadays we live in a world in which like, the products that we consume many times do not come just from a single firm. You know, like my phone, you know, obviously it has a chip that was made by someone, yes. it was assembled by someone else, it was marketed probably by someone else, and a lot of the software that I have downloaded was developed by a community of people. So now when, when I have like these this networks of firms, in this case, has anything changed about, you know, the incentives for them to share information, to close down the IP? How have you seen, you know, like the information technology and the information revolution of the last 20 years change that environment? And are the companies reacting in an adequate way? Wow, okay, that's a, that's a big question. Take your time. All right, so one of the thoughts is that as you know, information technology is making it a lot easier to search, to find information, to pierce the boundaries of organizations, to make it easier to find things outside. So there's been a long-standing set of theories that this is going to push more activity out into the marketplace because it's easier to find people who can do what you need. So there's some evidence that that's actually happening. So we're getting more marketplace activity, more growth um, in, uh, in some of these ideas. Um, one of the things that we can do to create incentives to cause more of this information sharing is imagine that it is possible to create these information marketplaces. If you're getting a 10% productivity enhancement by connecting people together inside an organization, that's a year's worth of education, which is a huge profitability boost, we know from very basic economics that you can actually, once you've taken an economy and made it more productive, you can make it even more productive by connecting it to this economy or that economy and linking them together and facilitating greater exchanges among those. So we may be able to take um, in, get information sharing across one to another in ways that, get, that increase the productivity of both organizations. There is a problem of strategic interaction. It is definitely the case that sometimes you'll get information leakage that you don't necessarily want in one of these markets. A great example of that kind of problem would be imagine the executive team of one organization is thinking of acquiring another small company. And they want to discuss whether or not this is going to be a good fit, whether or not it'll fit with their organizational culture, whether or not they can connect it to their operations. What's the price of it going to be? If this leaks out, well, then the price of the organization that they're trying to acquire may go up. You don't want that leakage. So one of the solutions for that is trying to create some protected spaces within your marketplace where certain groups can share ideas. The trade-off is always the broader the, and the greater the openness, 
the greater the peer review and the greater the feedback, and like the Princeton idea market, you get better ideas coming to the surface. The problem that you get is the loss of strategic advantage. So you're going to have to trade greater openness with productivity gains against loss of strategic advantage, which causes you to go more closed. And that's the trade-off that you want to balance in trying to, whether or not you're going to get more and more and more. Is that trade-off between the size of the pie and your share of the pie? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and when it comes now to, to this, you know, these interactions, you know, there, there are many ways in which information gets embedded and that organizations can interact. So you could, you could share like an idea like through a conversation or through like a document, or you can share, you know, an idea embedded into a good, you know, like in a platform mm -hmm. and so forth. And, or like a, you know, software development kit and so forth. Ah. Yeah. So now when we go <clears> to this, like in, in this type of changes, um, the, the more modern type of technologies, like the software, like this softer, more idea-intensive type of economy, is it different when it comes to IP than the hardware technology that you know we build the 20th century on, or 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 should we think of IP the same way now that we did 30 years ago? Wow. Okay. Let, let see if I can surface a whole bunch of different ideas uh, in that question. Um, one of these is that you know, when you think of putting information into different goods, we want to argue that you know, almost every business is in an information business at this point. So um, even if you're taking groceries or airline service or home building, you can almost always add information to an existing product. So one of the, one of the things that we're talking a lot about, this is a little bit outside the markets research, but information product design research. How is it that you can, the, one of our questions is, if you're going to be in price competition with other firms for similar goods, what information about your consumer or about your product can you add to what you're going to sell that's going to add value to the product in a way that they're going to appreciate it, and that's information that your competitor won't have that will make your product more valuable. So that's one of the things that you're going to want to do. I'll give you a couple of simple examples. Um, the mom and pop grocery store has a really hard time competing with a Costco on a cost advantage. Costco just has huge scale that a mom and pop shop can't get. Now suppose in contrast that the mom and pop shop starts to tell your information on whether or not you're allergic to monosodium glutamate, whether or not um, you, know, you have an insulin dependency. They can then match what's the product, the ingredients to your needs and that <clears throat> when you're checking out they can flag in goods for you. There are even certain stores starting to do that kind of thing. Well, all of a sudden the store is looking out for your benefit and now you're really happy that you're going to avoid an allergy or avoid a problem with an insulin um, sugar problem. And of course you're willing to pay for that because they've provided a really valuable information service to you. But the cost of providing that, it's an information good. The cost of adding that to the transaction is really, really small. So that's a way of adding information to a tangible good. Grocery stores typically have a 3% margin. You may be able to boost up those margins by adding information to your product. Second issue, how do you manage intellectual property? We're doing, I mean, one of the things that we're facing these days is in the information economy is much more of a remix society. What happens in YouTube, you know? Um, I may be able to take your fantastic song and have my son lip sync it, you know, out for his friends, or just someone push that to YouTube, you know? Or <clears throat> if, the, if the kid's soccer team is out there, you can put it onto music and actually get a more, more attention on YouTube for that. You're remixing different parts. Well, different, people own copyrights in different parts of that. So how do you navigate that kind of a problem? If it's the case under classic intellectual property law, I had to go negotiate with this person, that person, and that person to be able to post my simple YouTube video, no one would ever post anything. I mean, by default, we're kind of getting, getting off that problem. Folks are just kind of ignoring it. Matter of fact, one of my favorite examples of that is, you know, the, the evolution of dance? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've seen it on, on YouTube. It was like the number one hit for two or three years. You know, the guy that did 32 different um, you know, poses for the evolution of dance to different songs. Horrible violation of copyright. Any number of them should be able to just knock it off. But um, it was so valuable that no one actually took it off. One of the things we've been arguing for is kind of a, a, a change in intellectual property laws where instead of the default is that you have to go negotiate in order to reuse something like that and put it out there, you'd use a liability rule as opposed to a property rule. And under that regime, your default would be more that you would get to use something, and if you 
created some advantage out of that, then you would owe something back to the original owner, or if you created some damage, then you would be responsible for the fault. But you didn't have to go negotiate every single time with every single piece. A good example is, I think it was the, um, uh, one of the movies done by um, uh, Francis Ford Coppola or one of the others was held up when there was a copyrighted image of a chair in the movie. That's silly, right? It wasn't a big enough, it wasn't a plot function at all. So this whole set of lawyers had to then negotiate over it. Sim there ought to be some very simple ways of negotiating on that um, and figuring out with a liability rule what it's worth and then gaining a right automatically to go use it. Um, on YouTube, a very simple property is you can use statistics to figure out, well, did this child's rendition of it, of a particular song, interacting with this oboe or this particular theme, create a certain value, and any ads that are then sold on that basis can then be allocated among the different contributing parties. Everyone wins under a regime in which you can simply then create a fractional value going off to each of the pieces, as opposed to always having to negotiate off of it. And with a platform like YouTube, you can figure that out. And then you can think that there is a value that kind of like it's there when you have the remix uh, in a sense that many times you learn about some movie or you learn about you know some song or you learn about something by a reference that this thing gets in another media you know so for example there's a lot of you know famous movies that maybe the first time that people encounter them was in a Simpsons episode as being you know parodied or and so in general when there is this reference when you have like this remixing does it contribute to the value of the original source or, or tends to be more detrimental? What, what's your, your take on that? The, the real issue that you want to look there is at um, is it the economics of complements versus the economics of substitutes. Is what you've done a complement to the information good from which you're borrowing, or is it a substitute to the information good from which you're borrowing? If it's a complement, then there's an economic gain, and you can split some fraction of the revenues. If there's a substitute, then you're going to owe them the full value of whatever it is that you uh, took from them in the production of your own information good. So you can really look at the, is there a gain or is there a loss based on the economics of complements and substitutes. And, and how would you measure the complementarity in that case? Ah, so are you selling additional ads? Are you creating new markets for this particular good? Are there extra complements? Are you causing t-shirts to be sold when previously there was no attention for it? A great example of this, um, there was a band, I think it was uh, Numa, Numa Numa produced the song Dragostad in Tay. Yeah, Ozone uh, Band. It's a Moldavian, Ozone, yes. Yeah, yes it's a Moldavian right. band. Um, yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful song. Yeah. And I, for, I forget the name of the fellow that, that did it. There was it. this guy that made this YouTube video that made it really famous, exactly. You exactly. Know? That was a pure compliment, yeah. um, right? Because he brought enormous attention to the particular song. Now, technically, um, you know, Ozone would have had right to enjoin that production because they own copyright, but he brought enormous value because he brought huge attention for it. I think they wound up being on uh, Good Morning America. They sold additional albums, off largely because this other, Gary Brolsma, I think was the guy's name, had actually brought them additional attention. That was a pure economic compliment, not a substitute for the original good. So now let's, let's go back a little bit down like your path. So how did you get interested in information economics? In how, how, why that topic? Well, a piece of this was, came about years ago. Uh, I was interested in politics uh, and had actually done a little bit, of, and I was a computer programmer, uh, undergraduate degree in computer science, and um, you know, I'd gotten hired by one of the, the political parties here in Massachusetts to actually look at voter registration and vote gathering. And there's this wonderful question, what's the value of information? Um, it shows up everywhere. It shows up in the choices you make in the supermarket. It shows up in uh, price, you know, purchases you'll make online. It shows up in um, vote generation, in, in redistricting, in political uh, choices. And really wanted to see if we could come up with better models of what information is worth. Now, there's a long history of work on, you know, kind of decision analysis. That wasn't particularly helpful in trying to figure out what a piece of software is worth. Um, you know, how is it that you would price Microsoft Word on that basis? Or why is it, what's an economic business model in which you can give away the PDF reader or the internet browser um, or give away free search services? What's the economics of that? Where's the value proposition? How are you going to do that? There are so many interesting questions about the value of information. Um, that was one of the reasons for going back to school. Your grad school was? Grad school was a combination of management and economics. Um, the computer science has fantastic tools for 
um, information as a set of instructions. You've got to make a computer do stuff. You've got to tell it how to work. Um, economics, in contrast, has this wonderful body of theories on how to create or how to measure value. How do you um, rearrange resources to increase the value of the pool to create, you know, greater welfare overall? Um, so, in, you know, for, when you combine the computer science with the economics, you can get this question of, well, here's how you build stuff to a normative theory of what would actually be better for a group of individuals or better for um, a society. Use mechanism design to see if you can figure out how you can make people better off. And if we keep on going back, how did you get interested in computer science? How do you get interested in computer science? Um, well, I actually started in physics. Uh, undergraduate, um, you know, the, another one. The, the other, yeah, so, no, another person who's doomed to that. Uh, started in physics, undergraduate. Um, you know, it's in questions of how does the world work? How does stuff work? Can you, can you actually describe that? Can you control how stuff works? Um, and this was uh, this was in the 1980s, and uh, I, you know, it took several of the prerequisites in uh, mathematics for for physics. All in computer science happened to be one of them. And uh, it was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I was actually having to build a darn operating system. And there were parts of it that were a lot of fun. Um, I looked out actually over out there on the rest of the world and said, wow, there are a lot of really good job opportunities uh, in, uh, in computer science. So I actually started in physics to figure out how things worked and then moved into um, you know, practical building of things and great job opportunities moving over to computer science. And, and where, where did you did your high school? Where did you grow up? North Carolina. North Carolina. North Carolina. Down there in the deep south. And, and as a kid, what were you interested in? Oh, all kinds of things. Uh, swimming, girls, was never any good at any of that stuff. Um, swimming was always a lot of fun. Um, hiking, we had, you know, big dog, we'd always go take out a long time. Arguing with my dad, right? <laughs> dad was a law professor, so we had to argue with him a great deal. And all of those things, but uh, you're growing up in, growing up in North Carolina was wonderful. It's the research triangle park between um, uh, Duke, Duke and, UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, NC State. It's a wonderful place to grow up. Lots of interesting, challenging things to do. And and then when you went to college, what what was your choice and where what what did you start your well, academic career in? Um, so I started out as, as uh, physics, but uh, and, and where was this? Uh, this was Yale undergraduate. Okay. Uh, after, I took a number of the different prerequisites, and one of them was computer science. Uh, computer science actually had another interesting way of not just describing the world, but you could tell computers what to do and then have them work on your behalf. And they obey. And <laughs> they do what you tell them. It's absolutely amazing. So you actually, you know, in some ways, having described what the world can do with the physical equations, then you can actually go tell computers what to do and actually make them happen. There's some fascinating things going on in the world because Computers can become extensions of you as a person. They actually become, they can increase your influence. They can incre increase your ability to move the world. I'll give you an example of that um, in um, kind of modern business context. Think of how powerful folks can be um, in setting up new businesses. The market capitalization of Facebook is the same as the market capitalization of General Motors. Uh, that, that General Motors has maybe like 200 billion to, to, or 400 billion, like between 100 and 400 billion, let's say, a factor of four. Yeah, there. I think it's yeah, yeah it's 209,000 employees. Facebook has 2,000. Think of how influential 2,000 people have become in the world using technology. Technology is just an amazing way of actually creating influence in the world. That was one of the reasons for going to study computer science. So you studied computer science, but now you're working in information markets. Are you doing that from a computer science side, or it was because your career kind of like took a different path at some point? Well, it, think of it in the following way. Computers control information. The critical resource is information. So information is really the next stepping stone of how is that influence achieved. Which really, it's almost like you know, if you're, what you're really interested in is energy, you're not studying wiring. In some sense, if you're interested in information, how you create new information, inf how you make decisions, how you have inf influence via information, computer technology is a way of influencing that information, calculation, running models, communication. All of those are information actions. So the next step was to go study properties of information and values of information. So study economic models of, uh, of value, of control, of welfare analysis. How do you optimize sets of resources in a value sense? So really, the next step 
and progression from computer science was the step to understand well, what is information, how does that move things, how does that change things, how does that affect uh, decisions that you would make. And, and you decided to stay in academia, so what, what was the passion to stay in academia, what, 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 what do you like about doing research? Problem solving. You, I mean, one of the neatest things about academia is you get to decide what are interesting problems and go work on those as, go work on those to your heart's content. But you kind of choose interesting problems. There was a fantastic article. Um, it's funny, I wish I'd read that as a PhD student. I got to read it afterwards. It's done by Richard Hamming. There's a guy whose name is associated with Hamming distance, an information yeah. equation. And um, he said, you know, he, he had really interesting, because he said, and this was a guy who's absolutely brilliant, whose name is attached to scientific equations. He said he wasn't that smart, but he had a gift for choosing better problems. One of the things you get to do in research is to go after the most interesting problems you can find. So go choose interesting problems. How can you, how is it that information markets can create information wealth? How can you remake societies? Academia gives you the license to go pursue questions like that for long periods of time and go develop the tools and the resources that make, um, that make things possible. It's not just a short-term um, kind of research question. You know, uh, I, had, I, I saw a Twitter feed recently that had a really nice, succinct statement. Some of the best minds in the world right now are dedicated to getting people to click on ads, right? Well, why not get the best minds in the world to go remake society or find better you know, energy solutions or find sustainability questions? Um, you know, with a longer time horizon, you need more resources and flexibility to do that. We get to do that in academia. That's a reason to, to pursue academic questions. So uh, I, I think that's, that's wonderful. You spoke like a true academic with a passion for knowledge, with a passion for curiosity. And I would like, in that note, to, to thank you very much for, for sharing all those thoughts with us and for coming you know, to, to share also with our audience. Thanks for asking the questions. Thanks for having something like a forum for this, uh, for this kind of opportunity. Thanks, Marcia. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.